Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're going to be heading into the campground for a collection of scary stories. Don't forget to drop a like and subscribe and press the bell icon for even more stories every day this week. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I always hated going camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counsellor in training, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumoured that the camping trip was a time where the counsellors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I didn't know, however, was that the events of the camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods again. The trip began like any other. Altogether there were around 30 people on the trip, four counsellors in training, four counsellors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between 13 and 14, walking in single file, lined up and down the various trails. You could hardly hear any sounds of nature over the conversation and laughter of the campers. Several hours went by, and we made our way through a dense marshy area, and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counsellors in training, Jordan, as well as two campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers, until the last of them faded out of view around a bend of around 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after half hour or so the trail started to level off, and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by wildfire, and the other half to have died from disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated by a small, derelict cabin, sitting in the middle of the scorched forest, but seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through the area. We were so enthralled by this scene, that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned to look at where the sound had come from. Not twenty feet behind us was a haggard-looking man with a messy net of black hair and a long black beard, slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked on us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him, and we had no idea how long he had been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's speed up and get back to the rest of the group. As we turned to continue our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. The man uttered again, slightly louder, Going camping? Jordan answered that yes, we were going camping, to which the man smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Best be careful. We nodded and gave a heartfelt, thank you, and we're on our way. By this time, at a much faster pace, we began finding the rest of the group. Although the man had been walking up the same trail as us, when we saw him he didn't continue, but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail watching us as we made our way up the winding path and vanished from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up with the rest of the group, who had been waiting for us, and we told the adult counsellors about our interaction with the strange man. We finally managed to catch up with the rest of the group, who had been waiting for us, and we told the adult counsellors about our interaction with the man. They just shrug it off, 
telling us the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we were doing near his property. But still, I felt unnerved by the encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man had somehow followed us. Eventually, though, I put it to the back of my mind and managed to enjoy myself a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed, and Jordan and the other counsellors in training from the boys' cabin had brought two warm mic harders that they had stole from the counsellors' quarters, and I had taken out a joint that I had stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint, and made our way to the edge of the river, where we had to wash our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and the thought of the man from earlier kept coming into my head. Assuming that I was cold, not anxious, Jordan gave me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night, so that I could sleep in the same tent with him, and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this, and after smoking the joint we made our way back to our tents, which were pitched slightly away from the others, and we discreetly sipped on the Mike Harders while telling scary camping stories. Some time passed, and one of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly making up on the spot, when he suddenly stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away, near one of the other campus tents. As we strained to listen to what was going on, the noises stopped, even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to use the bathroom. Being stoned and hopped up from the scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide in our tents. Jordan followed suit, and we awkwardly made out before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late, when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sound of footsteps walking around near my tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible, and quiet my breathing. From the sound it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of my tent, seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan, but I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one I had been hearing, I closed my eyes and I was just beginning to drift back to sleep when I heard the tent unzip. I felt Jordan lie down next to me, and after a few moments he puts his arms around me and begins to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realised I had to go to the bathroom, and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie over his head before going still again. Quietly, so not to wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement, comforting myself that Jordan had just gone to pee, and was fine. I put on my shoes and began making the trek across our campsite to the designated pee zone. I had just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite, as if someone was rummaging through our supplies and bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull my pants up, and in my haste, lost my balance and tried to catch myself with a branch that made a loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look back up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite and in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly in my eyes, and the light was getting bigger. So whoever it was, they were coming towards me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got ten feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, Sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers might have taken it from my bag while I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out. But you were just wearing it when you were back in the tent. What he had said to me next made my blood run cold. What are you talking about? It's been missing since we got back for the river. I even went back down there to see if I had left it there by accident, 
but after I couldn't find it, I thought I'd check the boy's bags and that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror, as I realised that the man who got into the tent with me just moments prior hadn't been Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened, and I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent. And when Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow, lying still in our tent. What happened next was a bit of a blur, but we ran into the pod of tents on the other side of the campground where the older counsellors were sleeping and frantically unzipped their tents and started yelling for them to come out and that there was a man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counsellors slowly and groggily woke up, but after some more frantic yelling they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation when a commotion broke out on the other side of our camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, we heard the counsellors radioing back down to the camp to call the police and we could tell that they were as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept after that. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up and by the time a few of the other counsellors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, one of the other campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path, like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want the hoodie back, and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy we ran into on the trail. But his face, and that night, still haunt me. Last year, I went on a solo hike with my tent in Müritz National Park in Germany. I hadn't really planned on the route precisely. I just wanted to walk north, and after walking through the forest for several hours, it was slowly getting darker, so I wanted to check Google Maps to see where the nearest place to camp was. Camping is prohibited directly in the National Park forest, however I had no reception there, which I hadn't considered beforehand. So I walked on for a while, and eventually came to a small settlement in the middle of the National Park. There were maybe five houses and a small chapel right next to a small cemetery. Since the sun was slowly setting, and I needed a place to camp, I decided to ask someone who lived there. An old man was sitting in one of the gardens in front of the houses, and I explained my situation to him, and he offered me to sleep on the meadow next to the cemetery. Since I had no other option, I graciously accepted the offer, so I set up my tent there and made myself comfortable and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I suddenly woke up. I heard a child's voice, and I sat up abruptly, initially thought I'd only dreamt it, and I listened to the silence of the night for a few more seconds. Just as I was about to lie back down, I suddenly heard a child's voice clearly whispering, Hello? Who are you? My eyes were wide open. After a few seconds, I responded out of pure fear. I'll be gone tomorrow, I promise. Shortly after, I had footsteps running through the grass, moving away from my tent. I couldn't make sense of that situation. I was in shock and extremely tired. And, at the same time, I sat upright in my tent for probably an hour or so and thought about what had just happened. But I couldn't come to any meaningful conclusion. After succumbing to exhaustion, I fell back asleep. The next morning as I was dismantling my tent, I saw the man in his garden again. I went to ask him if there were any children living in the settlement. He looked at me in surprise, and after thinking for a moment, he told me that the last child had lived here over 50 years ago, but had sadly drowned in a lake nearby and was then buried in the cemetery right next to where I had camped. To this day, I don't know what to make of this story, but for me, it was definitely the creepiest experience I've ever had in my life, and I won't be forgetting it in a hurry. It was spring of 2016. I had just turned 24 years old. 
My friend and I just reached our main spot to camp, Black Canyon Rim Campgrounds, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We usually traveled out here two or three times a year. It has some incredible views and is only a few hours away from the city. For the most part, this area was pretty secluded. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away with a small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was on a dirt road directly off the highway with a campground sign at the start of the road marking local wildlife, any fire hazards and general news relevant to camping folk. The paving is mostly linear with maybe one fork spanning several miles. Once we traveled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us, one of the paths would take you to another highway entrance with a ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found on this path a few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance behind some larger foliage. The snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving for crisp air, a slight chill and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer and tons of little critters whenever we'd come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. We had gotten in around 4pm on a Tuesday. It was late for us and we'd usually try to make it out of there by noon at latest. This trip was pretty spontaneous. We both had work during the coming weekend and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast and we still hadn't picked our spot to camp. There were maybe two other groups, both families parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from the humans for a while. Customer service jobs will do that to you. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally picked the perfect area. A small clearing just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on, if the next night's incident never happened that is. We agreed to get a campfire going and would just avoid building tents on this strip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I'd sleep in the back seat, she'd take the passenger seat with the window slightly ajar. We'd have a few blankets for each of us and would fall into that unrivaled slumber. The next day went fairly uneventful. We just decompressed. I had this strange feeling throughout the day like I was being watched. There were crunching of leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured that it was just local wildlife doing their thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual, so I didn't dwell on it. Night came, and the feeling still hadn't gone away. My friend must have felt something she didn't vocalize though, she took some of her sleeping pills that she usually didn't need on our camping trips. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, I thought. It was nearing 1am. My friend dozed off in the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned against the side window behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite of me was rolled down slightly with a cold breeze flowing in. I had been on my phone scrolling through Facebook when I heard something outside. A few crunches of the fallen leaves, several paces outside the car. I whispered to my friend, Did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down and listened intently for a minute or two, but there was nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of the camp. I went back to my phone, scrolling through social media and about 10 minutes had passed when I heard it again. A crunch right outside the door. I lowered the phone. My eyes took a moment to adjust from the light of the phone into the deep dark of the woods. As I turned the phone away from me, the backlight illuminated the window above my feet. To this day, I can't get the image out of my head. Two dirty scabbed hands held onto the window. The fingers wrapped inside the car, the nails were long, unkept and dark. Behind the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed up against it. The breath would create condensation every few seconds, and all I could make out were the reflections of those empty, black eyes. 
I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. It felt like eternity. The staring contest between me and this... thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they run away when I noticed them? What were they planning? Was it the face of death? After probably ten seconds of not doing anything, the hand slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed, and a few seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunch melodically fading into the distance. I, still, just sat there. What the hell just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? With that thought, my body shot into adrenaline. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from her slumber in a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever it was, I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies we left outside and just crammed everything into the back seat and trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut and there they were. A grim reminder of the horror that had just happened. Two handprints, imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in a panic, a reaction to erase the evidence, I guess. I jumped into the front seat, started the car and floored it out of there. My friend finally coming, asking me what the hell I'm doing. We gotta go. Someone's out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted I slow down, and eventually I did. We reached the highway and I proceeded to drive 20 or so miles before we reached a Denny's, when my friend asked for us to stop and eat and for me to explain everything. The nightmares subsided a few months later. My embarrassment continues to this day for the state of shock I was in at the time. Everyone says you either have a fight or flight instinct, and I'm confused whether I have either. I mean, I just sat there and did nothing. I guess mine was freeze. I frequently tend to ask myself who was out there. Another camper messing with us? A resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe something more paranormal lurking in the forest? Watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to sleep. In the years ahead, we would still go camping there, but never too far from the highway. Whatever it was, I hope that was the last I ever saw of it. A buddy of mine and I tried to camp twice a month. Now that I have a vehicle that can be trusted to get me to some of the more remote areas of our state. We planned a camping trip for this past weekend. We chose a fairly remote location than we had been the previous weekend. The previous weekend we were the only people within a one mile radius of our camp spot. Friday night rolls around, and we got there and set up. This story takes place Saturday night at around 9pm, so the sun is long gone and the moon hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out, and other than what our fire lights up, we can't see anything. Suddenly, from the darkness we hear a man screaming. We listen intently, silently sharing an anxious look. At first we were hoping it was someone drunk, and having a little too much fun, but it quickly becomes obvious this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. It sounds so full of despair, anger and anguish. I'm going to take a moment to remind you that at this point it's 9pm, pitch black at night, in the middle of nowhere in the woods five miles from the nearest cell phone signal, and we hadn't seen anyone for hours. This screaming persists for what feels like hours, it was probably no more than five minutes. We had no idea what was making it, and started feeling extremely paranoid. We gathered up anything remotely close to a weapon, and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about fifteen tense minutes of fear-induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and a lantern slowly enter our camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic, how's it going, before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly but flatly asking if we could do him a favour. 
That depends on the favour, my buddy and I said in unison, obviously tense, holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out with us for a second by the fire. Given the two of us, plus our assortment of weapons gathered from around our camp to within our arm's reach, we decided to let him do so. After a short second of awkward silence, I asked him what the hell was going on, and he proceeds to tell me, and my buddy, that he was camping down the trail with his buddy, and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire, and begins to share his tale. We were just hanging out, man. We came up early today and my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming, then wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me. He lunged at me. I told him to back off and chill, you know, but he kept on coming. It started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me, so I grabbed my car keys, the lights, and ran. I didn't know what to do. He chased me when I ran. We don't have firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I looked at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then something horrible dawned on me. Wait, he chased you like he's on his way here right now? The man just slowly nods in reply. I'm right on cue. Like some terrible horror movie come to life, we hear screaming, maybe 30 feet from our camp, down on the main trail. I just want your balance, Gary. I want your balance, Gary. Gary, where are you, Gary? I'd never in my life heard a man scream like that. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. It was a brutal, guttural scream that was shrill to the ears, yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone gone completely mad, and the way he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing-song to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent and listened. By some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail, screaming the whole way. We ended up chatting with Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further away. We come to find out they had taken five grams of magic mushrooms each, and his buddy, who we'll call Ty, was a co-worker of his and was fine for 3.5 hours, then suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Ty thought he would kill Gary and steal his good trip. We hear the screams get further and further for over two hours. By this time it's 11pm, the moon is starting to come out, and it's below 30 Fahrenheit. Ty had no jacket or flashlight according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service, as it was snowy and icy, and required two to three miles of hiking and then driving after getting off the trail. Gary was still lightly feeling the effects of weed and mushrooms so he couldn't drive either and we had to make the decision to let the guy wander, hope he sobered up, and could find his way back. And he did, right into our camp. We heard yelling after an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet from the camp. Help, please, I'm lost. And we can tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case and greet the man with me carrying my 12-gauge shotgun and my .40 caliber pistol holstered. My buddy's carrying his AK-47 style rifle and his two 9mm Glocks holstered and with our flashlight on our brightest setting in his face. He was about 6'3 and 300 pounds. We talked to him, decided he was calm enough to walk with and walked with him back to camp. He seemed really remorseful, said he blacked out and didn't remember a thing. He had fallen out with his buddy and we escorted him to camp down the trail, returned and told Gary that Ty seemed cool and if anything else happened, to scream and come running, and that we would help him out. It ended up being a happy ending. We made friends with Gary, and I got his phone number to make sure the next day he got back to town safely, back to his wife and kid, and were planning a camping trip with him soon. But Ty, who wandered screaming like a deranged lunatic into the forest, potentially wielding a hatchet to murder your friend to steal his good trip, or whatever your psychosis film mind was thinking, for the love of God, Let's not meet again. This took place in the summer of 2022. So every summer in my city, 
Me and my friends like to make small campfires and chill in secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay campsite fees and stuff. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hangout to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one really goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears though, because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that, and my house specifically is located right next to the mountains and forest. But one night in particular, at around 11pm, I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get there. The spot I get to has a two minute paved walkway I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway are two lamps located at a halfway and another at the start of the bridge slash ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out. And then I get to the spot and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small wading area for toddlers and their families during the hot summer. So I set up the chair and get to digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, no way near the water, when all of a sudden I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud, it can only come from something equally large like a two-handed sized rock. I'm confused, because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water, even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water, and I don't see anything, so I kind of just brush it off thinking I'm just hearing things. But as I keep shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point I think something is falling from above, because logically something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above where some trees are, above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make a splash. So as I keep digging with my heart kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I just heard the rustling, and I call out, Hello? To no reply. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately, but there was no bear or signs of anything for that matter, so I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies and my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled, so I shine my flashlight over the area again, and as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress, because honestly of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be in his mid-forties, shaved, not bald, and a medium build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all the crap and getting the hell out of there, because now I've got it in my head that he's been throwing things in the water to try and scare me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceed to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me as I briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I'm frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in crocs mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get go. I make it to the halfway point, and a sense of relief starts settling in, knowing that I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he were a primate. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly got up from his stance and started standing on his feet and positioned his body to face me. 
After setting himself into this new position, the man starts running towards me, and I frickin' book it. I run as fast as I can down the path, my flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it but I didn't care, because a whole ass naked man was chasing me at 11pm at night in the secluded forest. I look back for a split second, and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of there alive. I finally make it out of the forest and run to my car, which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car, and like in a classic horror movie, I fumble, trying to get my key fob unlocked. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead. But I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my frob properly and unlock the doors, throwing my things into the back seat before jumping into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight most likely took no more than six seconds. As I tried to guide the key into the ignition, I'm fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just on a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was still coming. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch the sights on the road in front of me, and I zoom out of there as quickly as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call from my phone. It was a my friends asking me if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because, again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story. They all swear that none of them were trying to prank me or anything, and I also knew that none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out. But just as we're talking it out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful. There's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. Oh, really? Damn. Gotta go over that bridge to go home. Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so that I could tell them in person and show them where it happened. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said that they would make a note of it in case it happens again. Some friends says it's a cryptid, others say it's more realistically either a homeless or mentally ill person. I've never been a big fan of camping. Around 2012, my friend and I decided to take a Saturday night to camp on private property, on the bank of a small lake in the rural American Southwest. The lake wasn't very large, probably only 50 to 150 yards across, and was more of a deep pond, but it was five times as long as it was wide, and from the perspective of our camp, it consumed the majority of our sightline. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five to ten miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized southern city. That being said, it definitely wasn't easy to access, and the only way in was a gated narrow dirt road across a levee which spanned one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us his code and we pulled the car through and locked the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of the cities. Our cities are small, and the rural people around often live rough and wild. We have dense woods, so thick that they're not worth building in unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through a lot of it when they were building the highways in the 50s so not much development has happened in the last hundred years, and in some places since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30-minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see the stars and hear the sounds of nature. We were at our very utilitarian camp, small Coleman two-person tent and blanket, simply looking around and enjoying the night, when suddenly, my buddy sat straight. Hey, do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, 
Nah, it's just the dog playing tricks on you. He seemed very shaken. Nah, look, there are a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention, and so I sat up fully, rubbing my eyes trying to gain full focus. And then, I saw them. Small, round, white faces stared back at me from across the lake. Perhaps 15 to 20 of them, all positioned in such a way that their bodies were behind the trees and only their heads were visible. The best way I can describe the faces is like very pale, somehow internally illuminated children it would seem. I should mention that neither of us were drinking or high. We were too young for that, not for at least a few more years. We'd had dinner at home and were just planning on going to sleep and chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I was kind of sitting there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or owls or something. But I would never come to that realisation. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back at my friend and they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard excessive shuffling from the other side of the lake, and a few small branches snap. It's incredible what your ears pick up during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up when he said, What the hell are those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well. I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping, but what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the internet, but I never found a plausible phenomena that would explain that. If anyone else can, I'd love to hear it. I wanted to share the experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. It was around 11pm at night. I sat up and looked out of the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what appeared to be hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out in the early evening, but those were yellow and blinking, and after around half hour of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck, lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights, and looking back up, they returned. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness, and I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1am. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery on my new truck was dead. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power, and a week later I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if it's relevant, but I thought I'd add it in any way. I just wanted to know if anyone has had a similar experience to mine, because I'm left very confused, and I just wish I knew what they were. Years ago in Norway, I was enjoying a camping trip to celebrate one of my friend's birthday, and we had planned to hide the gifts in a small hedge maze close to where we were camping to make opening them more fun. Therefore, the night before, we all went to bed, at which point it was basically pitch black apart from the weak light emitted from the moon. I volunteered to go hide the gifts, and since it was so close by, the adults allowed me to hide them. The maze in question was in the middle of a clearing, and wasn't that big, being circular and maybe 20 meters across, so it didn't take me long to hide the gifts. When I was coming out though, I made the mistake of looking into the edge of the heavily wooded forest, 
and noticed an odd shape. It seemed to move a lot more than its surroundings. It was somewhat windy that night, so the plants were moving slightly, and seemed humanoid in shape. After what was probably only a few seconds, the shape abruptly moved, making it seem like the figure was suddenly facing me. The thing is that whatever the shape was didn't have a face. Where it would have been, it was simply flat. It's hard to describe just how terrified I was in that moment. Not only was I only 11, but I was alone in the dark maybe 5 minutes away from the rest of the campers. If I had to describe it, I would say that it was as if freezing water was suddenly poured all over my entire body. My heart felt like it had stopped, and needless to say I bolted the hell out of there, ran all the way back to the rest, and proceeded to explain what I had seen. Obviously none of the adults believed me, but my friend and some other kids did. Not really surprising since my friend group at the time was really into haunted stories and such. The next morning I went back to the same place and explored the forest around it with a bunch of other kids, but didn't really see anything out of place. Although I did find an albeit small spot where the grass looked like it had been squished, as if someone or something had been standing there, and it was around the place I saw the shape. Thinking about it in hindsight, what I saw that night was most likely a plant moving in the wind, but even years later I can clearly remember the jerky movement of the creature turning to look at me, only to be faced with a completely featureless face. It probably sounds stupid, but trust me when I say it's a terrifying thing to be able to remember. My buddies and I went fish camping at a pretty remote lake off a 4x4 trail about 2 hours from home. There were 4 of us, all men, with me being the smallest at 195 pounds. The camping spot has great fishing, as it has a nice, deep spot with lots of trout right next to it, but the campground itself is rough. It's on the side of a steep hill with barely enough room for tents and a small fire ring. It's accessible by a rough, steep winding 100 yard trail from where you park your 4x4 above the camp. We had a great day drinking beers, catching our limits on nice sized trout, and after it got dark we made a small fire and just chatted the night away. It was a great time. Suddenly there was someone shining a blinding light in our eyes from about 10 yards away. At no point did we hear this person approach. The person announced themselves as the sheriff. One of the friends asked, Oh, are you a Colo County Sheriff? The stranger didn't respond to the question. Instead, he shined a light in each of our faces, then said, Have a good night, then walked off. We sat there dumbfounded, asking each other what the hell that was. And after a minute or two, curiosity eventually got the better of us. So... I lit up this person with my stupidly powerful flashlight. He was about 50 yards away, right before the crest of a bend of the trail, right before he was out of sight. We all saw it. He was just some dude, in a flannel shirt and jeans. That's not a sheriff. He must have heard me, as you could see him start moving quickly for a second before he was out of sight. A moment later we heard an engine start, and that was strange. We didn't hear the vehicle earlier, but I attribute that to being drunk and loud. Now what makes this kind of scary to us, is what if it wasn't four big dudes he approached? What if it was a single person or a couple? What were his intentions? Should we have chased after him? Debatable. Should we have reported this to the actual sheriff's department? Absolutely. But regrettably, we never did. It all started when summer came, and me and my three friends, Lola, Cassie and Jennifer, were all planning to go camping. We were all excited and scared at the same time, because we were going camping alone. Lola asked her dad if he could drop us off and he agreed to take us. When the next day came, we started heading up. Lola's dad set up the camper that we were using, and there were some spare blankets inside too. Before leaving, Lola's dad got into his truck and turned around. He stopped and rolled down his window and said, No boys, smiled, 
and let us know he was joking and drove off. There were three rooms in the trailer, one master bedroom and two rooms with bunks. Each room had a TV in it, so nobody cared which room they got. Everyone knew that Jennifer didn't like small rooms, so we let her have the big one. I was in a room with Lola, and Katty was in a room by herself. I started unpacking when we heard a loud boom outside. Lola, did you hear that? Hear what? The boom? Yeah? We both looked at each other startled, and then continued unpacking, but something seemed off. It was the fact that Lola was so chill about it. I was done unpacking, so I walked outside and started a fire. Jennifer walked out and asked if I saw it. When I asked, saw what, she started freaking me out. Panicking, her eyes darting back and forth. And then she calmed. I felt as if something was watching me. So I turned around and I saw an orb in the corner of my eye, reddish black. But by the time I turned to look, it was gone. I was so freaked out, I told Catty she could cook instead. We had a family secret recipe of shepherd's pie and a bunch of vanilla cupcakes. There were about a dozen cupcakes left in the open box, so we just left it on the table and went to bed. I could hear the TV coming from Catty's room, so I punched the wall and told her to be quiet. Right after I said it, everything went quiet, except for a small scream in the distance. It didn't sound human. It gave me chills that ran down my spine. I doze off, but woke up in the middle of the night from hearing someone in the kitchen. I woke up Lola, and then we walked out into the small hallway that led into the kitchen. I saw Jennifer sitting on the table, staring straight ahead. Then, something touched me. I jumped and realized it was just Catty seeing what was making the weird sound. Jennifer was really creeping me out. She never stared into space this often, but then I noticed something in the corner of my eye. It was a shadowy figure. It was staring at Jennifer and slowly turned to face me and Catty. I froze and as did Catty. Jennifer then looked at us as if being mind controlled. Then the figure ran out the window and Jennifer dropped her head onto the table. We tried to wake her, but ended up falling asleep. This experience still scares me to this day and it's one of the creepiest things that has ever happened to me. Me and the others are still close friends, and we live together now, but we all remember that night, and that thing which we saw. When I was about 14, my dad and I went camping with one of his friends at a local park five miles from where we lived. The campground is located in the biggest state park in our area, with miles and miles of trails, many of which are for horseback riding and or mountain biking, in addition to be able to walk those trails. The day after we initially set up camp, we decided to hike some of the trails after breakfast. After walking about 20 minutes, we came to this group of trees with people both standing on the ground and hanging out from them. The odd part is they were all wearing medieval clothing. They all had some sort of weapon, and they were asking if we were part of some clan, and if that we weren't, we couldn't pass. We tried explaining that we were just campers walking along that particular trail, but I don't think they got it because they asked us the same question again. One of the people started coming towards us, and that was when we started running in the other direction. At the time, we weren't sure of who those people were, and what they were doing out in the middle of the woods. But now that I think of it, they were probably a group of people LARPing. But at the time, myself nor my dad or his friend didn't even know about it or that it was a thing. In that moment, we felt intense fear, but now we just laugh about it. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's camping stories. If you did, you can let me know down below. Don't forget to subscribe for even more stories every day this week. I'd also like to extend a huge thanks, as always, to my members and patrons. All the names can be seen on screen. You get your credits at the end of the video and a bunch of extra stuff on both platforms. Feel free to check it out if so inclined. But until next time, stay awesome and see you soon.